he, uh, he's done a number of um, talks for us. He talked at the uh, um, arc, tree archaeology conference in Sheffield a, a few years ago um, and gave us some excellent insights. And um, some of you will remember he also gave a talk at, um, at our symposium in York um, and fantastic um, uh, ideas about typologies for joints, um, which I'll remember uh, forever. And I'm really looking forward to the book on that. Um, so, Joe, over to you. Thanks very much, Doug. I'm going to share the screen. So, fingers crossed. Um, here we go. Okay, everybody, hopefully you can... Um... Yep, uh, we can see that, Joe, great. Lovely. Yep. Lovely. So I thought That's I would great. just start off by uh, showing you for those, because it's a, it's, a, it's a broad, lovely worldwide audience here. Um, I'm based in the southeast of England. You can see at the top left corner the, the little square. That's the, the southeast of England that I've come from. And then the bigger picture shows the uh, the area. And you've got the, the red dot is the museum and the collecting area of the museum is in the red outline. So that's very much uh, my patch, if you like. And when you're looking at vernacular buildings, um, it's very it's very regional. So uh, it, it's it's useful to sort of stay. You know, it, it's, it's fascinating to go outside of the region, but there is so much to learn within the region uh, that you can spend a lot of time devoted to that. So uh, so this is. Uh, I've got a new laptop and it's decided to forward the slides without me asking it to. Um, but the, there are two case studies I'm going to present, uh, both from East Sussex. Uh, but the, the red star is where the museum is. So let me just show you for those of you who don't know the Wheeled and Down and Open Air Museum in, in Singleton. Um, here's a lovely view of it here from up on the hill, showing the, the village area with its sort of uh, buildings from an urban situation that have all been moved and relocated uh, to the museum and here is the the wonderful uh, grid shell workshop which uh, some about three years ago I think some of the ICOMOS members you, you paid a visit to and uh, it's a fantastic workshop space and this is where the work actually took place. So <clears throat> I thought we would um, start off uh, by looking at the um, two of the case studies and um, one of them is a cottage from the 1720s and the other one is a barn uh, from the uh, late 18th early and late 19th century two phases but we'll start with the the cottage first and this is very much uh, taking an existing uh, archive documentary research and archive uh, and adding to it and here is the uh, the cottage Tyndall's cottage on its original site uh, in 1974 and if you look very carefully you can just see a, a dismantling worker just sticking his head out of the just above the ridge there that's uh, David uh, Martin's brother John I believe who just started taking the tiles off so this was the building on its original uh, site and it was due to be demolished because of a reservoir and the it was di dismantled in, in anticipation of the reservoir and the reservoir was actually dug in 19 76 and for those of you long memories who live in the UK 1976 was an incredibly hot year we had sort of 30 days of non-stop sunshine so the reservoir hardly filled at all during that period it was really not till 1977 when the typical British weather took place that the uh, reservoir filled and the red star indicates the location of the cottage so Tyndall's cottage was uh, one of nine buildings dis uh, lost to the, uh, the reservoir but it was one of only two that were dismantled one of them was uh, enacted into the uh, statutory the, the act uh, creating the reservoir and the other one was dismantled by the Roberts Bridge and District Archaeological Society and they very kindly uh, provided an interpretation report uh, some photographs and the labeling drawings uh, all produced at the time of the dismantling in 1974 and which I was uh, kindly given a copy of and here we can see the uh, interpretation 
uh, document showing the um, it's a two up two down cottage and you can see it's gabled at one end because we have a chimney there and the hip roof at the other end the hip terminal is very characteristic of the region so it's uh, it's blending both the function with the chimney and the sort of visual aesthetic characteristic of the region with the uh, the hip end terminal there and then we've got the uh, stud framing and it's 18th century and here's one of the, the photographs and we have to remember of course that we're back in the age of pre digital cameras here with the film photography and so in People tended to just take uh, selected photos, um, so 113 photos for the whole of the dismantling project. I mean, nowadays you could probably take 113 photographs in one day. Um, whether that's a good thing, I don't know. Um, but this is at the other end of the spectrum. So we've got a lot of good quality um, photographs taken, which were invaluable uh, during the dismantling, during the, my understanding of the, uh, of the building. And of course, even more invaluable were the labouring drawings. Um, so we've got the uh, end of the house, uh, the east end of the house here, uh, with the labels uh, clearly uh, identifying the various uh, posts, braces, girts, punctions, etc. So the, it was a very good documentary archive that was created in 1974. And the only caveat is that, of course, a tremendous amount of research and scholarship has gone on uh, since 1974, not least by um, David and Barbara Martin, who produced the uh, the survey report that you're looking at. Um, Tyndall's Cottage was survey number 69, and I believe they're now up to 2,500 or so. So they, they their knowledge is quite incredible, and uh, they've been written a number of books. And so it's by looking at that scholarship and research that we're able to um, have developed our understanding so much more. Uh, but this is really relatively in the infancy of the study of, of timber frame buildings. And of course, dismantled timber frame buildings are a wonderful place to start to understand them. But what about the timbers themselves? Well, there were 200 in total. And here we have them uh, <coughs> laid out in the, uh, in the workshop, a little close up detail here. Uh, but this was one of the challenges. The timbers had been in store for 38 years. And for the chemists amongst us, you will notice that you've got an aluminium uh, tag with uh, mild steel nails uh, holding, attaching the tag to the mm. timber. So you have bimetallic uh, corrosion, which is in the presence of moisture, means that the aluminium tag completely corrodes away. Now, thankfully, that hadn't happened to all of the tags. Some of them, it had only happened a little bit. So you could just about make out uh, a number in this case, but I wasn't too sure whether it was cross frame A or cross frame B, et cetera. So hence there's a liberal use of masking tape uh, and question marks as I'm trying to just identify which timber is which. Uh, but thankfully a lot of the labels were still actually legible. And so that's what a, a good label looks like. Um, to a carpenter, to be fair, it, it wouldn't have been impossible, given enough time to work out where all the timbers came from, um, but it is handy having the, the, the labels there. So my first task was really to uh, lay the timbers out, and rafters are one of the most easily identifiable timbers uh, that you're going to come across. Uh, they're long, thin, they've got a particular uh, joint at the top, a bridle joint. Uh, usually, and they've got a, a raft of foot no. lap at the bottom. And so, the, the, uh, the roof up, I was able to sort of separate the rafters and also to generate the plan form of the building to try to get an idea of the scale, etc. And you'll see the use of the, the masking tape applied again to the timbers. I can make lots of notes on the masking tape, it's completely uh, non destructive, so that it all gets taken off later but it enables me to keep track of my thoughts as I'm starting to understand the building because um, I was ridden short trousers when this building was taken down and so there's quite a it takes quite a while to familiarize 
yourself as a conservator with the actual artifact. Um, but by going through Joe, patient... Joe, Joe, I'm Hello. sorry to interrupt. Um, can I just say, can I just ask everybody to um, make sure their microphones are, are muted um, so we don't get any um, um, chit chat while uh, uh, Joe's presenting? Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Doug. So here we go. We've, we've, I've laid the roof out. I've established the, the, the plan form and I'm working my way through uh, working out which timbers are which and I've actually identified in this case that uh, A9 actually was a query but it really is A9 and you can see the little blue arrow in there that identifies its position within the frame and we would call that a rail and uh, the one with the red arrow uh, five uh, we might call uh, today a stud, but historically we would call that a, a puncheon, uh, a stout uh, timber of around about uh, six foot or 1.8 meters uh, in height. So this uh, I, I call taking the register. It's a little bit like a, a school teacher uh, greeting the class in the morning. You want to know who's there and who's not there. Um, the reason I want to know uh, who isn't there is because I need to start getting uh, timber in. And uh, I was rereading my uh, the Delhi principles for the conservation of wooden built heritage today. Uh, and I was glad to see that it makes the same point about trying to get timber of the same species, the same moisture content. Uh, and that's just what I was aiming to do here. And if you're trying to procure relatively large section timbers uh, of the right moisture content, um, it sometimes takes a little while to track them down. So knowing at the beginning of the project or as soon as you can um, what you're looking for um, means that you can get that part of the process underway in terms of the procurement of the timber whilst you're then attending to sort of understanding the building. So this was my list of missing timbers and the dimensions. Um, for those of you uh, in, not in uh, English speaking countries, I apologise, but th this is all in imperial measurements. Um, generally, conservators in the UK, we, we're bilingual. Um, we, we speak and understand the metric system, uh, but given half a chance, we seem to revert to the imperial system. Um, it's just, uh, perhaps it's my age, it's what I grew up with. Um, so that's all uh, in imperial. And um, I was then approaching this task very much like a new build project in terms of the sequence of the frames that I was going to lay out. So we generally, uh, there's a consensus, uh, not complete agreement I'm sure, but a consensus that generally the plan frames, the, the various sills and wall plates and tie beams uh, were the first frames to be uh, prefabricated by the carpenter. Uh, and then whilst you had the wall plates and tie beams, the rafter frames would uh, lend themselves to being uh, cut and laid out and cut. Then we think we move on to the side frames and then finally uh, onto the cross frames. And certainly in the southeast of England, time and time again, the, the evidence fits this uh, interpretation. Uh, and that evidence is based on the various uh, reference marks and assembly marks that the carpenter uh, places or cuts into the timber and that seems to fit the, the, the sequence. So faced with the dismantled timber frame I very much approached it uh, as a new build frame by laying out the frames as I would in the normal sequence. However, I don't adjust your screens, I still only had a very fuzzy picture uh, of the actual artifact and I didn't fully yet understand it and I think it's, it's it's absolutely crucial and I'm sure I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here but it's so important to understand the artifact before you start cutting it. Um, the medical analogy works very well here you wouldn't want your surgeon to be scratching his head while you're laying on the operating table you want to make sure that uh, he's it, completely au okay fait with uh, your condition and uh, they've made a, a decision on what what exactly what uh, what surgery they're going to carry out. So I didn't want to start cutting the timber yet until I fully understood the artifact. And I was helped uh, in my understanding uh, here because I had all the 
frames laid out in this wonderful uh, grid shell building. Um, I had uh, my colleague, uh, that's Richard Harris, uh, the, the former uh, research director and then the director at the Wilden Down Museum, who was making archaeological drawings of the timbers. And one of the reasons he was doing that is, uh, as you may be able to make out from the photograph, every single timber you can see there is second or third hand. Although the building was built, we believe, in the early 18th century, around about the 1720s, all of the timbers had been in at least one building before. So there were, there were layers of understanding uh, that we needed to sort of uh, interpret and fully uh, reconcile ourselves with before we started cutting, because it wasn't just a straightforward frame. Uh, and with Richard's experience and knowledge, uh, that was a great asset uh, to be able to call upon. And for example, he was able to produce um, a number of sort of con informed but con conjectural reconstructions of some of the buildings that these timbers might have come from in their previous life. Um, so for example, here, the, the two timbers with the red arrows um, may well have come, we can't prove this, but may well have come from a cross frame of what we know as a kitchen. So it might have been attached to a medieval or post-medieval hall house, or it might have been detached. Um, but it's just possible. So that's the sort of work that Richard was doing, trying to understand not only the building, but also the previous lives of the building, uh, a bit of a palim set. So after about a couple of, uh, on and off, a couple of months of looking at the timbers, um, we decided that we really needed to have a sort of a, a, a summit, a conference, and we were very lucky uh, that we were able to uh, call in uh, David and Barbara Martin, who had written the original uh, interpretation report and who'd carried out so much uh, recording and scholarship and analysis uh, of timber frame buildings within the region that the building came from in East Sussex. Uh, and that's David on the far left and Barbara on the right hand side there. And we spent the whole day. Um, looking at everything basically we went through it uh, step by step frame by frame timber by timber and anything we didn't understand we, we really um battled hard and, and, and reached a consensus um but we, we fully explored all of the options so that we really started to understand or i was able to understand what i was looking at and the the fruits of that meeting um are visible here we had about nine fairly significant uh, changes, if you like, to the original interpretation uh, report. Uh, and that's in no way a reflection on any sort of errors at the time. It was done in, in the 70s with the best possible um, information. But of course, as, the, as we go through with the dendrochronology and, and, and a lot more surveys, um, we learn an awful lot more. Um, and so the next slide will show you um, where we, I was, we were able to add information and enhance that uh, interpretation. So we've got the uh, names of the various uh, parts of the house. We've got the hall, we've got the buttery. Uh, the buttery was very much a, a, a storeroom. It's not where you actually tend to keep butter <laughs> itself, but it's butts uh, of uh, drink and other provisions. Uh, the milk house was where uh, various milk um, products such as cheeses um, would have been um, stored prior to either consumption or selling off at the local market. Uh, the brew house, the, the brewing of, of ale. Um, this part of uh, East Sussex is, is famous for its hops and so um, most farmhouses were able to uh, brew their own beer and the, uh, the infrastructure if you like for doing that was the copper. So the copper is a is a heating device. You um, have this large copper bowl and you can put the uh, wood, the firewood it underneath the bowl, heat the bowl up, and then the uh, smoke from the uh, firewood disappears up into the main chimney. And on the back of the main chimney, uh, we agreed that the, the evidence was there for a bread oven. So this reinterpretation um, really enhanced uh, if you like, the utility of the building. We could see far more clearly how the people had lived and eaten and drunk and sort of made the house a tool for living 
uh, if we can call it such a, a thing uh, from, from the 18th century. But there, there we have it. And there was also some changes. We had a, a new door. Uh, there's an awful lot of doors. You can see the, the red line there. We've got three doors hanging off one post there. We've got a connection between the buttery and the milk house, uh, as well as between the milk house and the brew house and the brew house and the hall. Uh, and you can see by the front door, there's rather a clash of doors. As you open the front door, you close off the door to the buttery. Um, but the evidence was clear that the hinges were there, the doorways were there. Um, this is how it was. And we were also able to reinterpret where the windows went. Uh, the top two drawings show the front and the east, uh, uh, east wall. Uh, at the museum, it became the north wall. Um, and the windows were moved from the uh, on the north elevation. It was that window went round onto the, the west elevation. So it, we had a much more symmetrical um, building. And not only were the timbers secondhand, but also all the windows were secondhand. So um, it really was, uh, we talk about recycling and upcycling today, um, it's nothing new. This has been going on for hundreds of years. So I can now uh, finally start uh, carrying out the work and you could see the, uh, the new timbers, the sills in the foreground there and various uh, window mullions, etc., that have been lost. And the red arrow at the, at the back shows the laptop computer. So not only does the, uh, Carpentry Conservator have the usual range of hand and power tools, but the digital camera and the laptop are now part of that suite of uh, equipment. And I'm basically entering as many details uh, into the uh, spreadsheets as I can find. So things like the, uh, the repairs uh, before and after the photographs, etc. what sort of type of repair. So if we take, for example, the rail that's uh, highlighted uh, with the red arrow there, we can see from the labeling drawing that is um, <coughs> G2. So that's a, a horizontal rail underneath the window. And the spreadsheet tells me that there are, are two repairs that were carried out to that. Uh, repair GR2, GR26. They were both patch repairs. And one of them was a face patch. And one of them was a, a timber tenon patch. So I can now um, find, go to the photographic library, um, which is here, and we have GR2. There are, there are three entries under GR2, and under GR26, we've also got three entries, um, essentially before, during, and after. So here is the before of the, of the rail, showing the uh, as found. This is where a later window had been cut into the um, the rail and losing the part of the front section there. This is the uh, timber that has been uh, pieced in and you can see the um, philosophy here was to keep as much of the original as possible. So I've contoured or scribed, as we say, the new piece uh, to blend, uh, to, to match the uh, pattern of decay and uh, it was found. So I have, I've removed as little timber as possible. And this is because it's a, a window component. You've got the central mullion there and the two little holes either side of it are for the vertical stay bars that retain the leaded lights from being blown um, in the wind. No, Here we have 25 minutes. Thanks, Vincent. Here we have the uh, tenon uh, that, that broken out at the end there. And that's a relatively simple dovetail patch that can go in. So. Uh, in the future, any conservator um, can go to this database, uh, they can look up any component and they can see the work that was done uh, at the time. And that's also accompanied by a, a very crude but effective uh, sketch. So even if there was some sort of horrible uh, data loss, uh, a certain amount of information has been retained in a hard copy. Um, this, this was made, so this accompanies the, uh, the digital record as well. So out of the 249 timbers that were re-erected as Tyndall's Cottage, um, 109 of them were in very good condition and didn't need any interventions at all. Uh, and this of course reflects the reason that uh, David and Barbara Martin, I suspect, decided on uh, that dismantling Tyndall's Cottage would be a good idea because it was in relatively good condition and this has been borne out by the 
conservation. Um, 50 timbers were needed uh, to replicate those that were missing, mainly window components. Uh, and of the 90 timbers that needed something done to them, there was 155 um, interventions. And if we break that down into type, and, and this of course is what spreadsheets are so good for, you can analyze them from so many different ways. We can see that there were, for example, there were 18 scarf joints. Now scarf joints come in a variety of forms. So um, we can see, in fact, there were four splay joint, uh, four splay scarfs. Um, uh, the V scarf, uh, this is a, um, a scarf that Roger Champion, my predecessor at the uh, Wilton Down Museum, uh, if you like, patented, for want of a better word. And it made its way into the uh, practical building conservation uh, timber volume. So um, for those of you who want to know what a V scarf is, uh, refer to that uh, seminal book by Historic England, uh, the timber one, and there's a picture there. And we've got the various butt scarfs, which tend to be used where things like doorways uh, have been cut through uh, timbers. And so you've got a very clean cut. And because we don't want to uh, lose any, any more timber, we tend to butt the new timber up to the old and use a combination of metal and epoxy resin uh, to bond the two together. So another aspect which I'm pleased to see has made it into the, uh, the Delhi principles is the uh, keeping of the uh, taking of samples and keeping of the repair, the offcuts. And this is the sum total of the offcuts. This is minimal intervention uh, in practice here. Um, and they're all labeled. And these are all the various pieces that have been cut off, typically the ends of uh, studs, posts and wall plates. Uh, hence the various V shapes that are predominating where um, new timber has been scarfed or patched in um, to, uh, to make good the timber. So in the museum uh, artifact store, we, we have the, uh, the computer server and uh, deposited on that, uh, we have all the various uh, photographs and uh, documentary uh, records as well as the, uh, the samples in the artifact store. So there is a full record now of the work that was done and why it was done and the photographs uh, to accompany it. So it, it's relatively simple to do if you do it as you go. It's not the sort of task you want to leave to the end of the project because you would probably never get around to doing it. It would be a Herculean task. But if you do it as you go, um, it really, the rhythm of the work dictates you take a before photograph, you take a during photograph, you take an after photograph, you index them as you go. It really isn't too onerous at all. And it's just good practice. And it means that you're, you're fully up to speed on where you are within the project and what's going on. So that was Tyndall's Cottage. Uh, I'm now gonna do the second case study, which is a, a multi-phase building, um, originally built in the late 18th century and then uh, adapted heavily in the late 19th century. So let's have a look. Um, it was the home farm or the, the local farm for the big manor house, uh, Summerhill, um, the seat of Henry Woodgate. And the original barn was probably built perhaps very much towards the end of Henry Woodgate's uh, tenure there in the late 1700s. Perhaps it was his son uh, in his son, maybe just before 1800. And that barn built around about 18, in the late 18th century was a hipped building, which is the local vernacular, a three bay barn. And you'll see from the, the end of the cross elevation there that we've got a, a cat slide or a lean to roof on the back. Uh, and that was contemporary with the barn. It wasn't uh, a later addition, 20 or 30 or 50 years uh, later on. And you've got the typical uh, threshing doors in the middle of the elevation there. And you typically have, as we have here, a pair of doors opposite. And the two bays at either side are for the storage of the uh, crops, the grain, and the central bay is for the processing, the threshing of the grain from the crop, things like uh, wheat and uh, barley, etc. So go forward in time to the late 19th century, and we find that Summerhill has been extended. Uh, the then owner had eight daughters, and so there was extensive um, uh, alterations and enlargement of the house. And it actually, um, Kent has got a number of uh, houses of large size, 
Uh, Knoll is known as more town than house. It's so large. And this is the second largest house in Kent. So it really is of some, some size and stature. So this was a, an owner who had some, uh, some money. So we find that he uh, basically enlarged or adapted the barn that seemed to be close to collapse, uh, I think, about 100 years after it was built. And he put a completely new roof on the top. Gone is the hip roof. Uh, hello to the, uh, the gable roof. But he's kept the, uh, the lean to at the back. So this was actually a building that I dismantled. So uh, I had a much clearer idea in my mind of the arrangement of the timbers uh, and how they fitted together. So putting the roof up uh, in the workshop presented a, was a, the ideal place uh, to start to establish the, the overall size and the, um, the way that all the timbers uh, fitted together in the roof. And again, extensive use of uh, masking tape and I noticed that some of the rafters seemed to have a, a, a repeating characteristic. There was a sort of particular crank or distortion in the timbers. And uh, over tea break one time, I just thought, well, I'll just see if those two rafters, you know, go together. Did they come from the same tree was, was, was the question. And so uh, I took the, uh, I, I looked at the rafters closely and I, you could see, <coughs> um, just before I get to that, I, I, I better come back to this point. But because it was a multi-phase building, some of the original rafters had been retained, but they'd been reused as studs. So they'd been removed from the roof and incorporated into the wall frame. And you can see those on the left because they've only got one set of laugh nails, whereas the other pictures show the uh, later Victorian, the 19th century rafters with two sets of nails. And you can see you've got those of you with very good eyesight you can see a little blue line on the third picture from the right and underneath that little blue line is a is a galvanized nail that's very well rusted away that represents the 20th century re-roofing and the two rusty marks above that represent the victorian uh lath nails that were the tiles were uh, hung on um cleft laths and nails have been the subject of uh, nail making has been the subject of a number of investigations and research in the last 10-15 uh, years and a colleague of mine Chris Howe has done some extensive work on the patents and this is what he calls the face clamp uh, nail made by Eubanks down in Wales and it was patented after 1869 so this late Victorian interpretation uh, was being uh, supported by the uh, machine made nails that were incorporated into that work. There were quite a few nails and so I was starting to lose track of them so I decided to make a, a small little uh, maquette if you like of the nails and you can see that the carpenters were using um, a variety of different nail sizes for the same task so we start at the bottom the rafter bird's mouth attaching to the wall plate you can see there were two different sizes of nails there um, the wind brace uh, has only got one nail into the into the soffit of the rafter, but the connection between the purlin and the rafter, four different nail sizes were used, all made from the same manufacturer from cords down in Newport in uh, Wales. And on the back of the rafter, you can see the three different sorts of lath nail that we used: the original Georgian lath nail from the 18th century, the Victorian lath nail from the late 19th century, and then the more modern mid 20th century galvanized now so this was just a simple way uh, to sort of sort the information out to sort of try to uh, put it into some sort of order and recognize um, patterns but yes getting back to my point about the distortion in the rafters the, the red arrows here show there were some matching distortions over T I decided to put the two rafters together and a little bit like fingerprint analysis um, once you, in my book, once you've got three different matches uh, with the knots, so you can see the, the knot pattern matching in those three photographs. That's all the same rafters, so that's a pair of rafters that match. If you then get a piece of card and draw on the, the radial fissures that you can see on the end grain there, and you put that onto the card and you put the rafter number on, you can start to uh, develop the various matches that you go and then you can sort of drive yourself mad as you try to make sense of it all 
but eventually you can arrive at, and arrive at something that actually hangs together and you've cross-referenced all the rafters all to one tree and so I've been able to rebuild the tree by looking at the various knot patterns and not only rebuild the tree I can make an estimate of the diameter of the tree because I've got what we call the wany edge the surface between the bark and the sapwood is the uh, gives me the a, a guesstimate if you like of the diameter of the tree and so this this information is just a very small bit of data that can be, uh, feed into the wider sort of uh, uh, woodscape studies that people are starting to undertake as to how many trees were used in a building, what size were those trees. Um, Professor Rackham started this in uh, with his seminal study of Grundle House in the 1970s uh, and a number of other researchers have, have, have uh, built up on that. So this just is another small little data set and once you've done one tree, we might as well do the rest of the rafters. And so here we are, we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five, so we've got seven, seven trees could be identified. And so all of these rafters and collars were all coming from a relatively small number of trees. And I've actually now uh, laid out in the workshop, all of the timbers are grouped together with the trees that they came from. So I've rebuilt the six trees, um, if you like as close as I can within the workshop and the two very long timbers that you can see there are softwood timbers that were imported from the Baltic probably from uh, Gdansk or Danzig and for the UK they're very long they're about 11 meters long 34 feet um, so they're, they're we don't really tend to get timbers in buildings that long unless they're imported so the question that I then asked was now that I had an understanding of the trees that the, the rafters came from, were the sawyers literally at the bottom of the job cutting the trees up on demand and were the carpenters just fitting the rafters as they, if you like, fell off the, off the saw pit? And I was able to, uh, by colour coding the various logs, I'm afraid that no clear pattern uh, is conclusive there. I don't think we can say that the sawyers were working exactly underneath the, uh, the job, but it looks as though the way that certain logs from certain trees have been paired up, that there was some there was something going on. Uh, but I don't think I can conclusively say anything more than that. Um, but here is the building re-erected, reared up, and the red arrow shows you those distinctive cranks that first started that investigation off. And the use of photographs, as we saw in Tyndall's cottage, those dismantling photographs are so useful uh, as an aid for when you're putting the building up. So on the left, we have the, uh, the photograph from in situ uh, where it stood in Kent. And on the right, we have the after photograph uh, when it's been reared up at the Open Air Museum. And uh, I'm afraid I can't promise you that I've got every piece of the timber in exactly the right place first time, um, but with help from my colleague, who was very good at spotting the difference. Um, we adjusted a couple um, and we were able to uh, get everything uh, to our satisfaction. Uh, and one tip I could give any, any conservators here is that if you leave the nails in the timber, uh, it's very useful because you can then get the nails to go back into their nail holes when you put it back up. So it's a very good cross reference. It just means you've got to take more care when you're handling because you've got lots of sharp nails sticking out everywhere. And again, a spreadsheet was uh, produced so I could keep track of uh, how much work I would have done, the various types of repairs that were done. And in terms of number crunching, 484 timbers altogether, 186 no work at all, quite a lot of replica timbers because a lot of uh, work could be done in the 20th century, essentially removing large parts of the, uh, the Georgian and Victorian barn. And 106 timbers needed some work and 40 timbers needed quite a bit more. And we had about 263 uh, interventions in total. And again, this is uh, all collated and deposited uh, in an organized way in the museum server so that in years to come, uh, the next generation of conservators has a hopefully um, not too onerous a task because it, it's quite daunting working your way through all this stuff. Um, but by immersing themselves for a day or two, hopefully within that, looking at the photographs, looking at the building, they, they would familiarise themselves with the work that was done 
and relate it to the work that they needed to do. And they would say, well, that worked and well, that didn't work. Um, so just to conclude, um, this is, of course is just a tiny little snapshot of the possibilities that you can do for um, conservation work. Um, but the archive material that you can use, produce can be in a whole variety of, of, of material formats. You can have photographs, spreadsheets, drawings, material assemblies. And it's critical, I'm, I'm sure you all know this, but it's so critical to understand the building. And of course, because research and scholarship is always evolving, if you've got an interpretation report that's say more than 10 years old, it's well worth spending some time critiquing it and really asking the question, is this up to date? Is this accurate? Because we've learned so much more. It's not a criticism of the people that produced the original report. It's very much more, we've learned an awful lot more because we really want to understand the building completely before we start the work on it. And of course, you also have to consider with the archive that you're producing, who is it for and how they might use it. And like many things in life, it's not a question of new technology being better, um, but just complementing the existing. So we're all using our mobile phones and um, computers, but we still, some of us still listen to the wireless. So you can have uh, both. So uh, thank you very much. That concludes the talk. And uh, I welcome any questions. Brilliant. Thank you. Joe. <laughs> uh, that was amazing. Um, everyone, everyone who's not seen Joe, didn't I did before? Didn't I tell you um, that he was um, worth waiting for? Um, incredible insights, Joe. Um, I love the bit about the uh, putting the, the logs together and your yes. nail. <laughs> Your nail marquette is, I mean, stunning. <laughs> well, I was confused, you see. So um, it, it's, it, it was just the only way I could think of to try to sort of what's going on here. You know, all these different lengths of nails. And, and then suddenly you put it into something like that and, and you, you, you can start to get some clarity. I mean, this reminds me of, of uh, some of the things that you were talking about, some of the ideas that you were putting forward and talking about in Sheffield a couple of years ago. Um, yeah. Did this, did this project generate some of those ideas? I, I was already working on it, but you're, you're quite right. It, it, that, that was really to do with uh, the number and the size of trees. That was really picking up on Professor Rackham's work and, and yes. trying to sort of, uh, develop it. And, and, and this, this adds another data point to that work, but it, it, it's a big subject. And um, I, I would be happy to work and encourage others to sort of join in that, to, to try yeah. to, because uh, um, it, it works with, as, you, as that conference showed, it works with so many other disciplines. You know, yeah. that's the exciting thing.